Hello, and welcome to our final video on the evolution of terrestrial life. I will focus this time on vertebrates, which are animals with backbones. So as the, as the cartoon here implies, vertebrates were far from the first organisms to move onto land, but when they did, um, they faced a lot of the same challenges that plants and invertebrates had to deal with. You know, one of those main challenges was breathing in air, because air is dry compared with water, and it's difficult, therefore, to keep the breathing surface wet. Uh, another challenge was supporting themselves to be able to walk around on land, where they didn't have the, the support of water against gravity. So as I said, vertebrate animals were something of, of latecomers to land, you know, tens of millions of years later than invertebrate animals, and likely more than 100 million years after land plants. So the transition of vertebrates to land occurred during the Devonian period, you know, in, in the range of 350 to 400 million years ago. So let's look at how they did it, and hopefully some of the things you'll hear about today might surprise you a bit. So the subgroup of vertebrates that moved onto land is, is called tetrapoda, or tetrapods are a subgroup of vertebrates with jaws, and it includes things like amphibians, lizards, reptiles, mammals, and birds. Most of, of you know, what you would today recognize as land animals. So the closest living relative of tetrapods are lung fishes, and so that means that tetrapods, including humans, are basically just a fancy type of fish that moved onto land. So one challenge with living on land is the need to keep the respiratory, or the breathing surfaces, wet so that oxygen can pass from the air into the body. And tetrapods do this by keeping our respiratory organ, our lungs, inside the body, which is then connected to the outside by a fairly small opening, which is our, our mouth and nose. And this may sound like a familiar strategy since plants and invertebrates basically do the same thing with their respiratory surfaces. So when did lungs evolve? Was that the trigger that allowed tetrapods to move onto land? Well, actually, an air-breathing organ isn't found just in tetrapods. In fact, the ancestor of all living jawed vertebrates appears to have had an air-breathing organ. Well, you might be thinking, wait a minute. Fishes don't have lungs. Well, that's sort of right, but it turns out, actually, that it's most of the most. What happened was that most of the modern bony fishes actually lost lungs. They lost their air-breathing organ. So there are two groups of bony fishes: the actinopterygians, or the ray-finned fishes, and the sarcopterygians, or the lobe-finned fishes. So lobe-finned fishes include the coelacanths the lung fishes, and the tetrapods, and all of them have lungs. Well, ray-finned fishes are most of the familiar fishes that you'd think of, and most of them, yes, don't have lungs. However, the bee shears do have lungs, and suggestion that actually lungs were actually lost at some point in the evolution of ray-finned fishes, and our common ancestor with fishes had lungs of some sort. You surprised yet? Okay, so while lungs were necessary for air breathing on land, it wasn't the trigger for moving onto land because lungs were actually around long before tetrapods were. So maybe it was the evolution of limbs with hands and feet rather than the fins of fishes that was the key thing. Well, life on land requires more adaptations than just having hands and feet in order to support the body against gravity. The hips, which is called the pelvic girdle, and the shoulder area, it's called the pectoral girdle, are also really important. They need to make strong connections with a rigid vertebral column or spinal column in order to support weight on the legs. So how did these features evolve? So the evidence that I'll talk about comes from what's now an increasingly good record of stem group tetrapods in the Devonian period. So we're not going to talk about most of these fossils here, but the phylogeny here shows some of these stem group tetrapods as well as some stem group lungfish, and, and sort of the evolutionary relationships with them and crown group lungfish on the left and, and crown group tetrapods on the right. So anyway, just to kind of reiterate a point that I also made in one of the Cambrian explosion videos, obviously the tetrapods alive today, such as mammals, mammals or reptiles, you know, they obviously look very different from fishes. But the early stem group tetrapods those that live closer, 
to the common ancestor that we have with lungfishes actually look very much like a fish. And it took a whole bunch of evolution to change the body plan from more fish-like to more tetrapod-like. And so in fact, you know, the animal drawn here is actually more closely related to you than it is to any living fish. Okay, so let's start by looking at the pectoral girdle, which includes bones such as the shoulder blade and the collarbone uh, that help support the, the arms or the forelimbs. So in fishes, these bones are actually still part of the skull, because fishes have way too many bones in their skull. Um, they don't actually have a neck, for example. So in, but in tetrapods, these bones have separated from the skull, which is reduced to a nice manageable number of bones. Um, and this is, the separation is by the formation of the neck, um, and it, the, these bones now support the arm. So the first stage in this was the development of a separate collarbone or scapula in the stem group tetrapod Eusthenopteron, shown here. However, this bone, which is labeled SCA in the diagram there, is still attached to the skull, though. So the fin is still attached to the, the skull. Well, next, the bones of the pectoral girdle actually separated from the skull, in this case forming a neck, and a separate sort of shoulder blade collarbone type pectoral girdle, although the limb still ends into a fin rather than a hand at this point. Okay, well now we're getting uh, something that's more, um, looks more like tetrapod-like, kind of like some sort of salamander or whatnot. Um, so in this case, the shoulder bones are, are much more robust. They're bigger, they're stronger, they have a stronger connection to the spine. So this animal could perhaps support some of its weight and, and walk around to, to some degree. It, it also has a wrist bone and digits, or fingers and toes, uh, rather than fins, although it has eight digits quite a lot of them, instead of the five like we have. Okay, let's talk about the pelvic girdle, otherwise known as the hip bones. And so as with the pectoral girdle, the early stem group tetrapods, the more fish-like looking ones with fins, had small and pretty fish-like fin bones, or hip bones. Larger and more robust hip bones again kind of evolved in these stem group tetrapods, but again did so before limb digits, before fingers and toes evolved, so these animals still had fins. Even after limb digits, fingers and toes evolved, the hip bones always, not, weren't always connected very strongly to the spine, so wouldn't have provided maybe as strong support for walking around as we see in crown group tetrapods. So. You know, the evolution of, of terrestrial locomotion seems to have been a, a fairly complicated process. I suppose that isn't really much of a surprise. You know, evolution works by trying out lots of different things, so we might expect it to be somewhat complicated. Okay, well, the, the vertebral or spinal column and the ribs are also quite important uh, because they support uh, the legs for walking, and in the case of the ribs, and support the internal organs when the body is, is lifted off the ground. However, most of our stem group tetrapods had pretty small ribs and, and also pretty weakly articulated vertebrae. And that would let their body kind of bend side to side much more. They could kind of good for swimming, kind of like an eel. It could undulate their body, but probably not great for, for walking around on land. And they also had, had sort of big, big tails. It would be good for swimming too. However, there are stem group tetrapods um, where the vertebrae interlock to give them more side-to-side -side rigidity, uh, so they wouldn't flex as much that way, giving it stronger support for walking. And they also have vertebrae that are different along the length of, of the spinal column. That's similar to what we see in, in many crown group tetrapods. Um, and this would include um, modified vertebrae that would connect the hip bones more strongly. So this kind of probably gave somewhat somewhat better mobility for at least some kind of walking on land, but probably still not, not great at walking on land. Okay, so given this complex pattern of, of skeleton evolution, were stem tetrapods mostly aquatic or mostly terrestrial? And why did they, when and why did they start living primarily on land? Well, we can put some of the evolutionary changes onto the phylogeny here, showing at least where we have um, the detached 
pectoral girdle or sort of shoulder area um, and, and, the, and a stronger pelvis where the fins evolved into feet and where the stronger and, and ribs and more strong interlocking vertebrae evolved. So the earliest stem group tetrapods, which basically looked like fishes, uh, were undoubtedly aquatic, but it's likely that you know, many um, stem group tetrapods also were entirely or, or nearly entirely aquatic, even some of these ones that had feet with toes rather than, than with fins. Presumably there's some, um, you know, um, movement towards better terrestrial locomotion. Um, there's, there's, somewhat, there's a bit less certainty about later stem group tetrapods, because they did have more adaptations that would be useful for, for walking around on land, but it's possible that they too were actually mostly aquatic. So it does raise kind of an interesting and, and perhaps obvious question. What were these animals doing evolving legs and, legs and feet when they, they mostly lived or entirely lived in the water? What, what are the legs and feet even for? Well, one possibility is that, you know, a better ability to move on land led to a better chance of survival if rivers and ponds dried out during parts of the year so they could kind of walk in a very bad way over to the next bigger pond and, and they wouldn't die. Right, so any evolutionary change that, that led to maybe slightly better terrestrial mobility, you know, maybe a pectoral girdle detached from the skull, could mean better survival of those animals and they would let, then be more likely to, to reproduce um, and to pass their genetic information on to the next generation. Perhaps limbs could, could have been useful for, for ambush predation, where the animal might rest on the river bottom and then spring up to, to catch prey that swam by. Maybe it also initially kind of the side-to-side -side bending of the body with this more flexible skeleton could also help with that as the animal could sort of coil up into a like sort of an S shape and then spring out. Or maybe the, the limbs with, with the fingers and toes uh, were, were useful for navigating in very shallow water, perhaps where there was like dense plant material or fallen trees or things like that. Maybe they could avoid predators in, in those habitats, you know, where the predators might live in the more open parts of the, the river or lake. It's also quite possible that these adaptations had sort of multiple benefits, but kind of regardless of the driving factors, it seems that most of the adaptations that ended up paving the way for life on land first evolved when tetrapods lived in the water. So a key point here is that organisms aren't evolving towards some kind of goal. It's not like they decided that living on land would be a great thing to do and then thought, what do I need to get that done? You know, they didn't like evolve features that would let them do this future thing. But right? evolution doesn't give organisms things that will necessarily be useful or that they need for anything. Incidentally, I kind of love the annoyed look on the, the beaver in the background here. I mean, you know, who wouldn't love, love a chainsaw hand? So what actually happens in evolution is that organisms evolve a whole bunch of very slightly different features. And some of those features in the population of organisms end up giving an edge in survival and other features actually might end up being bad for survival. And whether a feature ends up being good or bad for survival also depends on the conditions of the time, so it can change. What's good for some time can change if the environment changes. So at any rate, if an organism has an adaptation that helps it survive or reproduce more in a particular set of conditions, it'll pass along its genetic, genetic information um, you know, and then to its offspring and then that adaptation is likely to, over time, become more abundant in the population. And over tremendous amounts of time, millions of years, over you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of generations, these small adaptations will ultimately build up and, and lead to very different looking organisms over time. So another important point is that adaptations that are useful in one set of conditions can later help an organism with something very different if the conditions change or just for something completely different later on. Think about lungs, you know, which were around for a long time before vertebrates moved onto land. Well, you'll hear more, you'll hear more about this uh, kind of thing later on related to the evolution of flight in birds, but for now, that's it for the evolution of life on land, and thanks for listening.